let me just uh, say, yeah, you know, I hate doing this. I just, um, so you can critique me because we just were doing something on uh, presentations on Wednesday and, you know, this is not the way to do a presentation. I basically went through the CCTS website and looked at its samples and tried to pick out very quickly the ones that I kind of liked just as a springboard. Um, I just quickly look through them and they're pretty small, but um, it's more just to remind me, um, I'm a little sleep deprived between being on service and putting in a grant myself, um, kind of the things that I think about as a reviewer and get excited about when I'm looking at a presentation or a, a proposal. So let me step back and say, um, I'm not gonna tell you when I did my K, it was a long time a little while ago. Um, but I really, it's one of my favorite uh, mechanisms to review. Um, I've reviewed them for NCAM, which is the Alternative Medicine Complementary Group. Um, and then I most recently reviewed them for NHLBI. It's different institutes have different flavors, um, different, you know, diff different people, you know, think about what your, your research and your career development is. You know, there's no absolute one right answer and what we want to do is have a healthy discussion here but also uh, prompt you to look at lots of examples and then think about how to paint your picture in the way that really represents you so you know i, I was an art history major um, don't ask me hard questions right now about art history but um you know just think about the basic you know vermeer's great picasso's great they're really different. So this is your painting. This is, you're gonna look at, you know, good examples and then you're gonna make your own composition and you're gonna find your own voice. And that's why, to me, things like K's are, are exciting. Um, so the K, we're gonna spend a lot of time on the K um, background, the candidate's background, and then I think we're gonna touch a little bit, have a little discussion on the mentorship letter. So there's only about 12 slides here. So. Um, so what we want to think about, what, what, what is it about your background? You, wanna, you want to convey the message of who you are. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, I was born here and I did this, this, and this. But like, what are the big picture things that make you, um, you know, want to do the science that you're doing? And, um, you know, it, there's a fine line between, you know, giving too much detail about your personal life and um, tell, you know, making it a painting a picture though, so I can picture who you are. I have usually start with this um, area. Um, I take my grants when I'm reviewing them and I divide them up into sections and I staple them and then I take them with me. And I, so, uh, you know, one of the things you might want to do is when you're coming to sessions and you're seeing people who have reviewed before, ask them how they review. Um, I think other people kind of do things like I do, but maybe not. Um, but I'm busy, like every other reviewer, um, and I need to take it with me where I'm going. I usually read one grant at a time, and I usually read it twice, um, just so I can kind of get the flavor um, and make sure that I, um, if I'm not liking it too much, maybe I'll change my, my maybe I'll have more balanced perspective the second time. It can go the other way. Um, but I'm usually dividing them up by sections. And so I want to kind of understand, give me little breadcrumbs so that I know where the, where, what's the integration of your story to your career development to your science. So, you know, who are you? Why are you interested in this research? Um, read other people's backgrounds. This is, again, I think that was critical to me. I, I'm a cardiologist. I was doing something on counseling. And I read, um, I read grants, K grants on zebrafish. Didn't understand a thing, but I still read them for the structure. I read one on pediatric STD. I liked the structure. It really helped me formulate my mentor's letter and my um, how I structured the skeleton or the format of my career development plan. So you know, CCTS has a whole library. Um, I think I was pretty clueless. I don't remember if they had them back then. I had little kids. I, I grabbed K's from other mothers in the playground. Um, you know, it just, you know, talk to people and 
you know, ask them, hey, can I read your K? Now, you wouldn't want to read my K because it's a gazillion years old and the format's changed. But, you know, if you're writing like that AHA grant, you know, you know, find out who's, who's done stuff in um, AHA f uh, in similar mechanisms around here. And the CCTS is great. I mean, they really can help you. I was writing an R34. Um, I've reviewed that mechanism, but I hadn't written it. I wanted to see examples. I called up someone in, at CCTS, and they really helped me get examples. And I think it made a big difference in getting a very good score the first time around. Not fundable, but good. Very good. So um, it was all about like reading examples. Um, overall goals. So your background, you know, you're thinking about what are your short-term goals, what are your long-term goals. I want we're we're investing in you. So the reviewers, to me, I want to make sure that I'm doing the best job possible, not ripping you to shreds, but the best job possible, so that all the you know the taxpayer dollars that are going to fund you, um, and you know it's good for you. To, for me to give a good review, um, make you have that stepping stone from a K to an R to you know Nobel Peace Prize or whatever. Um, so you need to help me see where you're going, and that starts with the background. Okay, um, let's go into. So I these are all on the CCTS website. Um, I start to put in names, and then I thought I don't think I really want to do that because I, I don't know if I. I you know, I didn't know how they liked it, but, um, and again, I didn't read every single thing like a reviewer, but I looked through things quickly and I was like, what do I like? What do I don't like? Um, so this is an example that I know you can't read well, but you can find it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this thing, oh, here. So uh, they have, you know, career goals and objectives. It was right in the beginning of the, they had a little background about who they were, but then they're like, these are my goals, these are my, Objectives. Again, it's that breadcrumb. It's telling me where you're going to go. So short and long term. They're bulleted. So there's a nice little one sentence, maybe two sentences about this is what I am interested in. Um, I have insufficient training to become an independent investigator. My specific goals and objectives here are one, two, three. Why, why do you think that is just like, it's like making me feel like, I'm getting a massage or a pedicure when I read something disorganized. <laughs> like really, I'm just, maybe everybody else wanted in it, but I know there's reviewers who are feeling just as good about this kind of structure. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, am I over dramatizing bullets or numbers? It actually reviews that come back to you. So I am using a template from NIH that has bullets. It's saying career development, strengths, bullet, 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 weaknesses, bullet, bullet, bullet. So how easy it is for me as I'm thinking about my review in bullets to look at this in bullets. Plus, even if they had, you know, in the old days, they used to have, you know, you could write a, you know, war and peace as a review. Not that you should, but um, it's still easier for me to get your key points. So you're distilling, you're distilling your points. Um, you're distilling your messages into key points. And that's gonna help you convey what's really important. There's definitely examples um, in there that were really a lot more wordy. Um, and maybe those were, I mean, all of those were successful. So, you know, clearly you can put in more words. But whether I'm having someone read my grants who's in my field or someone who's a basic scientist, most of the time people who've been doing this for a long time are talking about the balance of white space and words. And the more words they are, when I'm looking at this at 5 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock at night or um, I just talked with a reviewer or a researcher who has to review for NSF, they're giving grants out to, to the reviewers two weeks before the study session. Reading eight grants two weeks before the study section when you're doing your own stuff is a lot. So you have to make it easy for people. And the more examples you read, the easier it will be for tired people, like reviewers. So, and it, it, it just, it defines, you will understand yourself better if you're able to synthesize who you are and what your objectives are in a simple way.
you will you will get yourself better. I feel like these are career development plans that are great to write, even if you're deciding you're going to do never do a K, because you end up having to write a business plan of yourself. You are in the business of your career. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I really feel like I understand like what she's going to do. Just, I mean, I picked this out before I even read every single word of it because it just, it, it, my eyes went right to this on the page. You got the gap. What's her current training? Oh, Mary? Yeah, I, I just wanted to. Awesome. Um, Great. Chime in, Lisa. Um, the one thing I like about these um, goals is that they have measurable outcomes. And so there are words in each one of these goals that then you can tie into specific pieces in a career plan. So it's very pointed in that way. It makes it easier to review and to write, actually. And it looks like, um, you know, there's some phrases that are italicized. I don't know if you, um, you know, kind of, your eye draws to certain things, italicized words, um, underlined words, bold words. I'm not a big bolding person. I feel like it just kind of, you know, I, I like underlining. Some people like bolding. Um, you can, you need to be thoughtful about what you're underlying, what you're bolding. Don't use all, don't italicize a phrase, bold it and underline it at the same time. <laughs> um, what do you think about that, Mary? Are you um, a I'm actually not a fan of underlining. Um, uh, I rather um, either use italics or bold, but I use both in a very limited sense. And I, yeah. I, like, I like to use them for words that sort of key into the review criteria. Yep, so reading the uh, program announcement or um, knowing what the basic sections are for a review. And again, go to the examples because there were examples um, on the CCTS website where there was a, a little more bolding than I would have done. Um, I'll use um, italicized to, you know, in a, in a proposal in the specific aims maybe to say our long-term objective or, you know, just the long-term objective of that term or short-term objective of that term. Um, whereas I, I'm an underliner, so I might underline my outcomes for aims or things like that. The more you look, the more you're going to figure out your style. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it, uh, is it like precisely uh, need to do like underlining or italicize or folding certain text in certain way or it's just personal choice? I think, you know, from my discussions with people, there's no set rules and it's a personal choice. And mm -hmm. it's just like a good meal. Don't, you don't want too much spices or too much food. You don't want a little, you have to find ways of communicating that um, don't overwhelm the reader. Um, to me, that means you're going to try to get people to read it. Um, you want to have a bunch of different, ex you know, people um, read it. And maybe you don't want to have like your mentor have to read 30 versions because I don't know, I get tired. Um, so you want a fresh pair of eyes sometimes. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Mary? Um, I would agree. And I think um, your comment about you wanting people to read it is really key. You want to make your uh, development plan very accessible, very easy to read, very clean, not repetitive. Um, the easier you make it to read, the easier the reviewer will have, and the more likely it is that you'll have a good outcome. Yeah, readability. You don't have to use 50,000 big words. And I think we say this in a lot of our, um, our uh, meetings that we do here that, um, you know, I might be, you know, the cardiologist who's the, you know, let's take NHLBI, you know, there's pulmonologists, cardiologists, but we all do different things. And we might be assigned something that your grant that's a little bit out of, or a lot out of our scope. Uh, the, the, um, the assignments have to be balanced between conflicts and, you know, you, 
you, you know, they, they're really doing is a tough job. And so, what, you know, I might be reviewing something that's a little bit different. You have to make sure that it's readable. So I used to tell my mentees, give it to your mom or your dad, see if they can understand it. But I think that, um, you know, giving it to somebody who doesn't do what you do and making sure they feel excited about, about it and they understand at least the big concept is important. Absolutely. So um, along the career or the candidates plan, um, there is, you know, this, again, I tend to read these things first. I want to know a little bit about you because we're funding you more than, you know, just as much or more than the research. But this is an opportunity to do a little bit of an introduction for the mentorship team or, you know, you don't have a ton of pages, so it's got to be their letters and, and bio sketches will be complimentary. Um, the example that I'm going to show you in the next slide has a mentorship team and advisory panel. I have seen things all over the place. I think when I did mine, they were all mentors. Um, you need a primary mentor, a primary sponsor, but you'll need to think about who do you, what's your area of expertise, what are the gaps that you need training in, and you'll need mentors that complement the aims and the training that you're outlining. So, and then you need to think about who, if you have, I had a mentee who um, did a KO1, he was doing anticoagulation uh, implementation research. So his primary uh, person was a um, PhD nursing and learning health systems who does implementation. Um, but so he clearly needed somebody who does anticoagulation and that person was a cardiologist who had no NIH funding. So they complemented each other. So that's, that's an important um, discussion to have with your mentor and even maybe somebody who's outside of your area um, the specific AIMS workshops are a great way of doing that because we can tell you, oh, you, know, you need someone who has some NIH funding on this team. Uh, mm -hmm. You need somebody who can help you with the, you know, making a decision aid tool. Uh, those kinds of uh, forming your mentor, mentoring team and then having a good hard talk with your mentoring team and maybe adding some advisors. Um, your career development plan needs to include some training. You just said you had some gaps in research methodology or whatever content. So I, every um, group I've been on re study section has wanted to see some formal courses and some informal. So if you only have, I'm going to be talking with my mentor once a week over coffee, that's a little too informal. Um, formal is, I got zinged the first time I put my um, tay in because I thought, how do I know what courses are going to be offered at this institution in a year? So I made some general stuff and they nailed me. So I'd go back and say, I'm going to take course, you know, 352 in the fall. If I get, and I get funded and it wasn't offered, I changed it. But uh, courses need to be specific. I'll give you an example. Um, I have seen a lot with some leadership training and my mentor is going to help me and I'm already on this committee at this national society. Um, I think I, it's not like you have to have that. You certainly don't have to have that, but I think it kind of adds. And then I always like to see a table on time, like mm -hmm. we're funding you for 75%, you know, and it looks like you're doing 50% clinical, you know, at, do the math, add it up. Um, I'm going to just move, uh, while uh, Mary's commenting on that, I'm going to move to this example of the table that came from the same, oh, I do have the name. <laughs> I'm not HIPAA compliant with this. So <laughs> she's not patient. I this just wanted to add in something, Lisa, about the didactic training. Mm -hmm. um, to not forget that there may be really good opportunities for training that are specific to your needs that might be outside the institution. So I'm a basic scientist, so I think about things like um, perhaps the Woods Hole training in microscopy or the um, New England Bio Lab boot camp for molecular biology. I mean, if you are looking for something that's short, that's focused, that's very intensive, things like that actually might be a really good opportunity. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, and again, you're thinking about your aims and you're thinking about this is my background so far. This is my gap in training, and the courses are helping you relate the, 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 the objectives or the gaps you're going to address in your career 
um, to the research you're going to do. So it's a whole nice package. It needs to always relate. You're going to hear that from anybody who thinks that, who wants to talk with you um, about K's. The, the, they have to relate. You know, your research, your aims for your K, and your, your knowledge gaps or your trading gaps. And you're going to have to explain to the reviewers, the readers, why it relates. And so just don't assume that because you insert something into a, a coursework block or into a, um, a mentor block that the re reviewers will know why that person is there. You actually have to be explicit. Yep. Sorry. Um, so the question is about, you know, a training um, in, you know, like a behavioral interventions that NIH offers and you have to apply for it and you might not get it. So um, I, I think if it fits in what you need in your research, definitely put it in. Um, but you can also say, if I don't get this, I will do this course or that course. Uh, we, we know that, you know, everything doesn't work out perfectly. Um, so I would say, yeah, put it in. The other thing I would say is perhaps load something like that on the front end so that if you don't get in the first time, you have time to reapply and then have the backup that Lisa mentioned. Yep. So uh, if I uh, include like K in outside organizations like in the Institute, can I uh, Include that budget, like that money. You need to go there and have the training in the, in the garden. So, if uh, include the money budgeted for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, okay. you're um, you're you can budget for training, and you're um, you can also you know your institution, your division chief, and your uh, let's say it's cardiology and internal medicine. They might write a le nice letter saying, "Hey, listen, this guy's a rock star." Um, he's gonna we're, gonna, we're gonna make sure he's an assistant professor when he gets this. Um, we're committing for him to go to this, um, and you can budget partial funds for it. Um, your mentor also, you know, these are limited funds. Um, they've gotten better than they used to, but um, your mentor, and we'll talk about this a little bit, there's key components and, and people want to see a strong support from your mentor and your mentor helping you if, you know, you know, what you want to do might fall short. Now, they're not going to give you a million dollars to do X, Y, and Z, but they should be able to help you with some gaps. Um, so I put this table about, this. Is, it says table one, research and career development timeline and benchmarks. One of the things I liked about this table, um, and I, I love looking at tables. I feel like I, that helps me is a reference point to come back and look at the aims and the you know, you and your career. Um, I, when I, um, I, I was trying to I write a, a K24 and I went through and wrote probably like six or seven tables. And I would, I actually gave some examples to my mentee and said, do you like this one or do you like this one? I was kind of thinking, you know, the analogy of like, you know, when you're painting a wall or something, you might put up a couple colors and walk by and like, yes, I like that. I mean, you could do that with tables. Tables, like really, they're like bullets. They just nail the important things. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I liked about this, uh, and it, this is just my opinion, is that you've got activities um, by the, I can see the timeline right at the beginning. I can see the aims. They don't give me all the exam, all exactly what the aims are, but we know it's a developmental aim, a pilot aim, um, and then they're applying for an R01. Then they've got like the kind of mentorship team, the mentors, the advisors, like the general, um, what's happening. Um, so there's a primary mentor who has conducted clinical trials around HIV, might SAG, and this candidate's meeting with him weekly. This is so easy to miss, and it, if it's like, and I will find it. I, uh, I mean, I always look for that. And if it's not, if Mike Sag's letter says he's going to meet with this candidate every month, and she says weekly, I won't. 
I'm not going to triage a grant and totally diss it if everything else is perfect, but just it's details. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's got the timeline, the aims, the mentorship team, and then it's got coursework and it's got uh, informal training, hands-on training, seminars and conferences. It's a one-stop shopping for like what the text was all about. Do you, um, I don't know if you can see that too well, Mary. <laughs> well, oh, I, could, I can see it great, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, great. The, the other thing I like about this table is it tells us why each of the mentors are in the team. Um, the only quibble I might have with the table is that it would have been helpful perhaps to have a little more detail on what those course numbers are so mm -hmm. that you didn't have to go back and hunt in the text. But other than that, I think it's a terrific summary. Yeah, I've got a, um, I can tell you, I'm going to just skip over. So this one, um, it, it actually, this was a draft of a KL24 that I wrote. That's a mid-career mentoring. So you don't, you're mentoring other people, not, not them. But um, so I kind of used a similar framework, but I put my, in my abbreviation legend in the below, I just put this, the, uh, what the course titles were. So you can, you play around with it. Everybody says, you know, the, you know, you work and work and work on your specific aims page and you do, and you should, but to me, you work and work and work on the tables in the career development plan. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Mary, did you have specific things that you look for? Like Lisa mentioned, I really look for the same things. I mean, you're looking for what are the gaps? How are the gaps going to be filled in terms of skill set and how whether or not the applicant can tie that development to um, how those things will help build a successful academic career as an independent investigator. I mean, that's that's really what we're looking for. Yep. So you got, you know, your training so far, you so far, mm -hmm. your gaps in your research training, methods, content, whatever. You've got mentors that will help you reduce those gaps. You've got courses that'll reduce those gaps and those gaps tied to the research plan, the aims, and your future illustrious career <laughs> and that future Nobel. Uh, the other two pieces on this particular table that I think are key are that early, um, submission of an R grant, that mm -hmm. K to R transition is, is a tough one. And so having that as a specific point of focus, I think is critical. And having that backed up by much even earlier manuscript submission is also key. If you don't have manuscripts and publications, the R will not be, um, it'll be a struggle. So you have to focus on that as well. I, I think that's a really excellent point. So if you're you know, applying for your K in a year, you know, whatever, you want to have a good hard talk um, with yourself and your um, mentorship team or your potential mentorship team about, you know, what your institute or, you know, your area needs in terms of publications. Uh, NCAM, we had a lot of alternative practitioners, maybe not so much publications, NA, NHLBI, you know, I've seen K people who have like 80 publications. Now that's, you don't need 80 to get a K, um, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't have two. I like to see, and I, I put this in a list in the mentorship letter, if you don't have a lot or you feel like you're in a little bit hanging out on the skimpy side and not just below the median maybe of what maybe you and your mentor think, have a plan of like, well, I have these submitted and, um, and then have that mentor write that in his or her letter that, you know, my star mentee has just submitted these, you know, couple things so that, you know, even if they're not on your bio sketch, we know that you're working hard and then you reproduce that in your, like they did of, you know, I've got to do this research and I'll have a systematic review on X, Y, and Z in year one and I'll do my, you know, baseline data results in year two and I'll have three abstracts in each year. It has to be reasonable. Yeah. So are you suggesting adding that to this table? I would, I think it, 
I don't like it too, too busy. I feel like this is just enough. But certainly you could, um, if you have a little bit of space, say I'm, I'm intending to write um, three manuscripts in the first two and a half years or two years or whatever, depending on the K-leg, and they'll be on these general topics or something. I think it also depends on what type of research you're doing. A basic person might, you know, you know if you're right, it depends, I mean, I'm doing a clinical trial right now. I can't write on the results, you know, it's like, I mean, this thing has been going on forever, but I can do some other things around that. I think thinking about that with your mentor is important. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, Mary? Because I know you're doing some basic science, so it might well, be different. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you have to think realistically about the kind of science that you do um, and outcomes for one type of science might not be the outcome. In basic science, the publication is your outcome. I mean, that's your metric. Um, but in some types, it, it may not be. And so as you're talking about clinical trials or some sorts of long-term epidemiological studies, your outcome in terms of a manuscript may be way down the line, but you need to think about what can you develop as scholarly activity that will build your academic portfolio before then. So the, the focused review, some sort of a, a meta-analysis of work that's been done in the field previously, things like that that would help you um, build that credential. Yeah, so if like, for example, this person is, um, I didn't print out her aim, so I can't remember what they are, but um, let's say her early um, manuscript submissions in the months 13, 18, they might be a, a systematic review or meta-analysis in the area that will directly help her write her background of her R01. Um, if you have to do a thorough literature review, you might as well, you know, make it count um, mm -hmm. as a publication. Um, mm -hmm. Other things here, I mean, UAB has some amazing cohorts, Cardia Regards, you know, the HIV cohorts. I mean, there's just a wealth of data that um, I feel like as I'm writing a clinical trial that might not get done for a couple of years, um, if I'm lucky, <laughs> and, or, or, you know, 10 years or whatever, I'm supplementing um, uh, my knowledge and it helps my, my trial design be better. So that mixture of um, established data or um, smaller kind of studies that help you get publications that are directly in line with the aims for this K yeah. and your R. Yeah, um, another thing to think about sort of in a feed forward fashion and it kind of ties in with what Lisa says, if you're in basic science and your next step would be an R basic science grant, that's one set of metrics where you have to build credential. But if your K is in say AHRQ or PCORI or something like that, think about what your next step R type grant might be and what you might have to build to make that successful. All right, so this is another person, not the same person, but um, they divided up a few things. Um, I kind of like those tables, like the one we just talked about, where you've got mentor team, you know, you've got, you've got most of w the elements that are key in the career development plan in that table. Doesn't mean that they didn't explain it in text a little bit more, but um, a lot of people, will do like a separate table around the mentors. And again, you know, who they are, um, what their expertise is, what their role is. You can't have it not, you can't have everybody be a primary mentor. There has to be one designated one. And then again, that key sort of last column um, where you got the, you know, I, how often you're gonna meet. So pretty basic. Um, they might make a few, uh, you know, comments in the text about that, you know, Dr. Baskin is the primary mentor because the, you know, my gap is in this and, the, and it directly relates to the, these aims. Whereas maybe the GI oncology person is a specific content mentor or will help with one particular aim. Lisa, can I ask your perspective on something? Yep. Um, so what's your sense um, and the review groups you've been on to whether or not it's critical for the primary mentor to have NIH funding? Um, yeah, I'm 
I feel like it's critical. Uh, I mean, that can be if they have some VI, VA, but I mean, if I'm seeing, um, if I'm seeing a lot of industry trials and, um, and that's the primary mentor, I mean, the whole, to me, one of the central points of doing a K is so that you can write an R and um, at least within cardiology, you know, feels like anybody can be, you know, doing a clinical trial, at least as a site PI. And it, I'm not saying it's not work, but you're not, you're not learning how to do a um, study protocol from scratch. You're not learning all the nuts and bolts. And so I want to see the primary mentor, um, particularly in areas around clinical, you know, trials and clinical research. I want to see that they, they have what it takes to help you get to the next level. Right. No, I, I agree. And I think that's an important thing to remember when you're trying to find that primary mentor. Yeah. Yep. So is it um, that is currently you should have or they have previously that? Uh... Um, they should currently have. I mean, if mm -hmm. there's, if... Uh, like if they have a history of like two or three hour one, but not that trip. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we that there probably would be some discussion. Um, everybody on those section know they're writing their own grants. They're they're working their you know you know what off to try to continually get funded. Um, I'm in a no cost extension, so you know I can't tell you how many grants I've written over the last year. Um, and they're and they get scored, and then you get back again. So it takes time. We get that. We get that. I mean, I, my scores from the fall. I, have to resubmit now. So, um, so, but if there's a gap of a couple years, then you start to get worried. Um, uh, and you know, if I, if you're on, you know, if you're, uh, if you're, you know, you've got effort. Your mentor has effort on other grants. Is actively collaborating. Clearly has some pending then in their score, you know, I put in my basket to this one, you know, is pending as a resubmission, it got this score. Mm -hmm. uh, does that, what do you think about that, Mary? Did um, you hear I, I heard, yes, I heard. Um, okay. I agree with you completely. Yeah, so we, you know, I, everybody gets it. They're, you know, the reviewers are the, have done, they've been there. Most of them have had Ks. Some of them actually have current Ks, at least in the clinical study section in NHLBI. They've been trying to not have, you know, people like me, old farts who are there forever, but they have a more balance, um, which I think is good, but we all uniformly get that there could be gaps. Mm -hmm. Does have to be primary mentor or any, like, no, other uh, uh, co-mentor or advisory? Yeah. Um, the more people on your mentorship team that have funding to me is good, but the primary mentor, I feel like my anxiety of how you're going to get into a fundable K um, goes up if your primary mentor hasn't had a good funding track record. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have some people like one of my mentees, I mentored him because I had NIH funding on his T32, but then he found a, a good funding source in dissemination and so she was the one to be his primary mentor it wasn't her topic area so he had somebody like maybe this gi oncologist i don't know what they i don't know what they're i didn't look at their bio sketches but you know you want to have someone in your content area but you want i feel comfortable having the primary mentor know what it's like to get you know hrq nih that kind mm -hmm. of stuff i have a how much overlapping in the research with your mentor in there. Okay. It depends on what training grants and what your aims are. So, like, um, like my one, like, can I say, like, what been you done? Like, upper PhD, Right, right. No, I know. Um, you, so you're, you're at a little, so he's doing a K99 and 001. So the first couple, the first three years, is it three years yeah, or the like 90? And then you transition to more of like a mini R01. Um, you've got to show some, you got to show that you're getting a little bit independent from your uh, primary mentor. Uh, mm -hmm. But still, you know, you're part of that grant is a K. So you want to have, you know, you want that person to, to help you figure out how to, how to navigate. Um, 
And then the other thing I like to see is a biostatistician on there. Um, it just may, I mean, it's easy enough to add. And sometimes I'm looking at these things and I'm wondering why didn't you have that for, for, to me, for clinical research, um, mm -hmm. you need, you need it. I don't know if that's true in basic, but. Um, it depends on the kind of work you're doing, but, um, it doesn't hurt. I mean, a lot of the statistical approaches that we take, and actually some of the basic work that I'm doing right now, the statistics are kind of a nightmare, and they're not for the um, um, casually trained <laughs> statistician. Um, so uh, it depends on the work, but certainly clinical work, I think it's imperative to have training for sure as part of your development, and mm -hmm. having someone like that on your team is not a bad idea at all. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, the CCTS here, um, the specific games workshop, there's usually like two biostats mm -hmm. people who love to help you and give amazingly good comments. So mm -hmm. uh, it's one stop shopping for, for further answering those questions. Yep. I have more questions because I, yeah, I always. Yeah, we can take so, questions afterwards too. So, okay, so the question is that you have to have a letter from each of the appraisers brand member or? Boy, I can't remember that. I feel a little brain dead. You need, you need one. We're going to go through. Let me table your question to the last slide because I have a slide with bullet points on mentoring. The primary mentor is the most important one. But because um, because uh, they, have, they have certain limitations of the letter. Like, I think my grand one, five or six letter. So if you have yeah. like goals. I'm well, going there's to always things you can do. Yeah. I can, we can talk about that. Um, I just going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this example. I just wanted to bring up a couple examples. So this is, this is the same grant. This was the one on the mentors. And then this one kind of goes the timeline on one column and then the activity. And then there's a lot of stuff here. And so I had a little bit more trouble reading this um, just mm -hmm. because it got a little bit more busy. It's pretty. It looked I mean, you should download it and look at it. It's a gorgeous green, total UAB. But, um, and I like shading, but it was, um, this is again, you know, this got funded. So, you know, I'm not saying anything. Um, and again, I love colors, but you know, I don't know why I just didn't react as well to the year being on the column. And, and I think that, you know, as you're writing your grants, I know it sounds stupid, but, or maybe it's just me. I happen to like writing tables, but you know, put them up on your bulletin board, put them up on your fridge, walk by them and say, you know, I know what's happening. Or, you know, maybe if it's out of your free fridge, then all these other people are coming going, what is this mess, sir? You know, I know exactly what you're doing in the next five years. Um, I don't know, what, what do you think about this one, Mary? I mean. Um, I, I don't, I've, I'm like you. I don't, I think this is a bit too granular, too busy. Um, I like very much the first one that you showed because it puts together the whole package. It has metrics, it has mentors, it has courses. Um, I just like that, that one a yeah. lot. And, um, and there's a lot, yeah, just, it's hard to find out, like, it looks like, you know, there's names of mentors here, wow. like informatics and stuff, but you have to work a little harder. Remember, um, some of us reviewers are getting older and, and, uh, and we don't, we don't read as well. <laughs> Basic premise is that anything you can do to make the reviewers like easier is the good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yes. The table before this, the uh, the columns are centered instead of justified or uh, even to the left. Do you have a preference? This has come up just in general with your entire grant. Do you like to be justified or do you like it to be to the left? Uh, you know, I'll tell you. I mean, again, I'm a little bit of a table geek. I find them a little relaxing. So if I'm having trouble writing text, I go and write some tables. I put them all in a page. PowerPoint, I sound ridiculous. Um, and then I kind of look at them and print them. First of all, by putting them in a PowerPoint, if somebody's asking you to present about like work in progress, you already got it. Um, but you know, I'll try it a bunch of ways for my own stuff. And then um, I, again, read a bunch of things. So, you know, I read an R34 that I really thought was cool. And then I'm collaborating with someone actually in health behavior who uses tables in a different way. And I switched kind of to her tables and 
um, the more you read, the more you're going to get a sense. So I sometimes I think I like this kind of center, but I don't. I don't know if I would have used it for words. I think I'm more of a using it for um, numbers. Is that you? Oh, good. I thought it was me. <laughs> it could have been outside my window. <laughs> yeah. um, I would right. add in on um, text. I, in the text of a proposal, I'm really a proponent of write justification only. I find it easier to read, and I almost, I absolutely insist for myself white space between paragraphs, every paragraph, because again, it's easier to read. Um, so that's, you, you find your way. Yeah, and you might change a little bit. Right now I'm in a um, left and right justification mood. I don't know why, and I've heard, uh, you're, Mary, uh, I know other people who've said it feels a little easier to just write justify, or, um, and I, I just happened to have read, you know, some examples of things that I liked. Uh, but I definitely like the space in between and if I'm tight for NIH I'm usually tight so I'll do a, a space of like five to six font between mm -hmm. paragraphs um, and uh, and to me visually that feels okay um, you know I just do a merit and it has 14 pages I felt like not even counting the business games it was like loads of space so I put the 11 in between it felt like Whoa, there's so much white space. So um, this is again, show it to different people because people will have, there's no one right answer, but what you want everybody to do, the bet, you know, when somebody is, is presenting you in a study session, they're like, this was very nice to read. Um, mm -hmm. Feels really good. And I know that sounds like, wait a minute, they're not even talking about the science, mm -hmm. but you know what, if you have your, you know, stuff together and you've, made a pretty grant it's going to be easier to get the science and we're going to feel like this is a person who dots the i's and crosses the t's right. so you know <laughs> that's going to go a long ways if you have a little i'm dyslexic there's always at least a typo in my grant which mortifies me when i'm re-looking at something um but if i can make it best grant with the most compelling story about why this research is important and it looks my tables look gorgeous you know people will you know my k i had a snarky mentor who barely read the k it was not really ideal and he put snarky comments in my proposal and i had to every time i got comments back which thank god wasn't that often um i had to run through and look well, I, um, I found I had left one of the snarky comments in. It got funded, but you know, that's mentoring disaster 101. But um, so, it, you know, we want to know that you spend as much time as we're trying to spend on your, on your grant. And I would add too, though, if your grant is dense, there is no white space, there are a lot of acronyms it's and it doesn't read easily your science is hard to find yeah. your career plan can be hard to find um so just think about that so investing the time to make something that's smooth easy um clean to read just a pleasure to go through um is worth the time you know it, this is true for writing papers it's true for certainly mm -hmm. true for grants um, more words on the page doesn't mean we think you're smarter. Mm -hmm. um, and you will do yourself a favor in really understanding yourself. You know, people in leadership always talk about the elevator speech, but you know, this is a, you know, super size me kind of elevator speech. So if we can really understand you, you can really understand you. Um, so I'm going to think uh, this one. I want to say was um, another example, again, um, different person. It's a little bit on the busy side, but I like how they're using the graying out to tell us a little bit more about, you know, what they're going to do lipid metabolism and CVD and then some informatics methods. I still feel like I go back to thinking, you know, I really like the first one because I got as 
you know, pretty much 95% of what needs to be in a development plan was actually in that table. Um, this one of note is, has, exact, you know, where the location is. They're actually going up to uh, University of Michigan to do some hands-on training. Um, so you kind of know where they're going and what they're doing, but, um, you know, What's all of these were funded. Yeah. What's missing in this one though, if this is a comprehensive training plan, it doesn't tell us anything about the timeline. And yep. again, that's what I liked about that first one. Yeah. And you you are kind of you I mean, your idea is that, you know, the the headings one, two, and three might relate with the training gaps and might relate with the mm -hmm. um with the aims, but they didn't help you lead it. So now Mary and I, as a reviewer, are having to flip through different pages to kind of get that. Um, this one, they did do a timeline that was, you know, separate from the activities. So again, mm -hmm. if you're making three tables, we're trying to put it together because this is an integrated, um, you know, process and you're making it just a tiny bit harder. Um, and this one, I'm just going to skip through this one because we have, we want to talk a little bit about mentoring letters and things, but this is an integrated timeline. But it, again, I just want to see a little bit, it's a little bit too wordy for me. Mm -hmm. I agree. What do you think about, um, and I don't know if the first one included, I don't see it. Okay. Yeah. Including the aim as part of the timeline. Um, some of the strongest ones that I've seen have included A1, and these are all the things that I'm doing under yep. A1. Okay. So this one was the first one I showed. This is a K23, and they did say the AMs, and they have just a very brief AM1 is development, AM2 is the pilot. I guess they only have um, two AMs, but um, so this one is a K24, again, um, that I was putting together, and then I, I moved, so, but um, I, um, I, I, what I did, so it's going to be a little different than the K23. I like the first example, but what I wanted to do was really have a one-stop shopping for everything. I could have, I had enough time um, to put like, you know, what was aim one, just a tiny bit, not the whole hypothesis. So I could have done that, but um, you know, I, I looked at a whole bunch of different tables and again, wrote like probably like six to seven tables before I kind of, and I meshed together what I liked about one mm -hmm. versus another. Um, the nice so, thing about that one, Lisa, is that it, it acknowledges that part of the career development is actually doing the research. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so, and then I think... Oh, no, I didn't do that. Um, sometimes you can actually put in, like, um, I've seen them where they actually are able to even squeeze in that, you know, clinical time is 25% or teaching mm -hmm. is five, clinical is 10. That's a lot. As long as you can get, like, who you're mentoring, if it's K24, or your mentee, you know, who's mentoring you, you know, when the aims are, when the training. That's the other thing is, you know, if you're taking a course on X and – you're taking it in year three, but that related to your aims that you're doing in year one, you know, we, we were like, well, you actually needed that training in year one. So just make sure that your courses match with when you're doing your aims or the activities related to your aims. That comes up. So people are looking really carefully. Uh, so I didn't, it's hard to get examples of mentorship letters, um, uh, you know, but I felt like reading a bunch of them, you know, uh, I know, uh, I think a fair amount of people draft their mentor's letter, um, certainly helps uh, in two ways. One, your mentor is busy, and two, you have a decent shot of knowing what's getting into your mentorship's letter. And sometimes people write not very good letters, so, um, you know, I'll do that for any, you know, consultant, anybody, um, they have to be decent. So the most amount of space is going to be to the mentorship letter. And I can't remember if it's like two pages, that primary mentor. Um, to me, the critical components are that, 
I want to know what your what the mentor's experience is in mentoring others. And that doesn't mean I mentor a lot of people because we will, you know, slash that comment. You know, I mentor, you know, 10 postdocs and three pre-docs and, you know, my mentees have received a total of, you know, five, you know, Ks and, you know, the majority have moved on to R01s and our associate or assistant professors or, you know, detail, detail. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, huge, but I would say primary mentors, having a whole paragraph on that is important. Mm -hmm. And then I like, hey, I've got this funding. I've been continuously funded since, you know, biblical times. Um, you know, they're going to look at your that person's bio sketch, but still, you know, say good things. Actually, this K-23 that I'm looking at, it's about a four-page. Four-page? Okay. So make sure you spend time. Don't, don't overlook those details. Yeah. And it, you know, it's it's not something that should be whipped off at the last minute. Um, you know, the research experience. You know, again, this is going to be a mentorship team. So if the, somebody's experience is a little bit different than yours, you know, you've got to have somebody else that says something. Now, you had asked about the the total. Look at the institute that you're applying for and how many letter things they can be. And if you've got a cast of thousands, which you shouldn't have in your mentorship team, um, first of all, advisors, you know, they're look at the, the things, but you, you probably don't need letters from them in the application or you wouldn't be able to. So, um, but you, if you've got mentors, but you only have this much space, you know, you could have it where you, I, I have seen this where somebody has a half a page for saying, this candidate is the best thing since baked bread and I'm going to help them be even better in this way and this way. And this is my experience. This is my funding, you know, short and sweet. It's the main mentor that you're going to spend the most amount of time on. Mm -hmm. So is it, uh, you know, if you have big name in the field, in your, uh, everything, you mean it here or just anybody who has this part in the well, I think it kind of depends. There's a trade-off. So um, I, we certainly had a lot of discussions in study sessions I sat in. And if you have a big name, this guy's track woman is traveling like a maniac. They have like 15 gazillion grants. And, you know, you're like, this, does this person going to pay any attention to this guy? Do you really think that the, they're going to meet with this guy weekly? Um, sometimes it's good to have the big name. Um, you know, Maybe it's also good to have somebody who's a little bit more junior who you know is going to be really there for you. Um, maybe you want to have both. Um, certainly, you know, the primary mentor might be a, a slightly more junior, you know, not God's gift to the science, but you, you reviewers know, we know who's going to spend time with you and not. And then you have a Secondary mentor is the, you know, Nobel winner who's crazy busy and you probably will see once a year. You won't say it in your grant, but you'll. Okay. Um, what do you think, Mary? No, I, I agree completely. Um, you want somebody, look at the bottom line on your slide here. You want a primary mentor who can commit the time. And if the primary mentor has the big name, but they'll say, oh, I have the big name. I have all this experience and I'll talk with my um, this person um, by Skype once a month for an hour. Um, that's not going to cut it. Yeah, that can't be a primary. No. Uh, so, so you want, so the mentor's letter, again, you know, you got like, I guess, four pages. So, you know, they have to brag about themselves. Um, and so if you're drafting it, you have to like make sure you know their CV, you know, all that good stuff. And then they have to brag about you and, you know, what you're going to do. And if there's particular gaps around writing papers, um, I feel more comforted if the person says, I am going to work with this person specifically so they can have, you know, these publications and these topic areas over this time so that I know that that person is, again, taking the time to know your, you know, you at your best, you at 
what gaps could be addressed, helping you reduce them from a research science point, but also from a career point, so that by the time you're, you know, towards the, you know, latter half of this K, you're you're in good shape to get an R. Right. And I've seen a letter or two from a mentor that bragged on the candidate a little bit too much and said, you're, you're the best thing since sliced bread. You've got lots of publications. You've been successful in X, Y, and Z ways, leaving you to wonder, well, why does this person need a keg? Go write an R. Yeah. yeah. So you gotta be careful. Yeah, that can come up. I mean, if you've got like, you know, two PhDs and, you know, a hundred publications, people are gonna, you know, wonder about that. Um, and again, making it very clear what your training gaps are is important. And that's going to be personalized. And we all have gaps. I mean, I don't think I'll ever not have gaps. But um, and this, is a, this is a unique and really great time to me um, to be able to think, you know, hard about, you know, about what your gaps are and what your passions are and how to to improve the strengths to get you to to really answering fun questions that you love coming to work to do um mm -hmm. you know it's a it's really you know i feel like i don't know that i appreciated it when i was writing my k23 um for a number of reasons but um at, when i was thinking about and starting to draft up the k24 i felt like this was it was a hard but really um, very good process to go through. And I actually feel like I was coming out of some other meeting. And I said, you know, I kind of feel like, you know, making myself do on a less intense level, but you know, at least those tables, it's a career development plan. We all should be doing that. I think that's the last slide. So do you have anything to, to add Mary or? Um, just that having this mentor's letter be personalized to your needs is absolutely key. I, I suspect that there are individuals out there who have stock training plans. Um, that really becomes very clear to reviewers and won't help you at all. Yeah, and you know what, if you've done a good job with your um, tables and your career development plan mm -hmm. um, and your aims, then that's gonna help um, you and your mentor really draft a highly personalized letter. Um, I, what, how much more time do we have, Becky, or? Um, I know that both of you have other commitments, so it's 12.15 now, so we can go to 12.30, sorry. All right. I'm fine till 12.30. So one other thing I was thinking about is the institutional letter. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen them from division chiefs, I've seen them from, in, you know, Department of Medicine, um, you know, so, and I've seen them where they write a, a letter together. Um, to me, the key elements that I've seen discussed over the years are um, making sure that, again, there's some detail about you, but we know that they don't, you know, they might not know you, you know, they don't have coffee with you every day, but that there's a institutional commitment to, to you. So mm -hmm. if it doesn't say um, that you're gonna move from an instructor level to an assistant professor, um, or that you're you know, on the tenure track, or, you know, and again, it can be slightly different things, but if there, that letter, and you'll probably be drafting that letter in most places, needs to have something about the institutional commitment, and that actually might be something that you even might wanna talk with the project officer, um, who will be listening in on there. Oftentimes they are not in the room um, and they're not talking while we're reviewing things, but um, they are listening in and they know what the conversations are. So you can ask, well, what is it, what, what, you know, what, what do we, I need um, in terms of for my institution to demonstrate a strong commitment to me. If it's not there, um, you know, you could, you're like, you've just killed yourself for what, a year or more? And, um, and then we're thinking, well, I don't know. Um, it's not, it, it can be really, you know, I mean, I haven't been on the receiving end of that criticism, but when I know it's being delivered to a candidate, I feel like, you know, I feel bad. Yeah. Uh, 
to, what do you think about phrasing the institutional commitment, Mary? Um, it's, again, I would look at the review criteria and what they're actually, there is some verbiage there that says what they might be looking for, but they can speak to things like career progression, what the opportunities are to help um, faculty with career progression. It could be talking about opportunities for like intramural grants to help you and that sort of preliminary data for next steps. Um, it could be about protected time. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that could potentially yeah. be addressed there. Yeah. And protected time is probably one of the more important ones. Because, um, you know, that gap between like, you know, your, you know, as you're applying for this, doesn't get funded the first time, which is the majority of times, at least in NHLBI, and you're having to apply, you know, you want to, you want your research um, career to be progressing. And so you mirroring that in the institutional commitment. You know, the other thing is there, there's a lot of leadership training and research training and training in, in, um, in all these different things um, that the CCTS does. Um, I know in the past in Michigan, what we, um, we would add some descriptions um, around activities in the CCTS into the resource or environment page. Um, if you've ever looked at a, at least the clinical grants from Harvard, my God, they're like, goes on and on. So I, I, I end up having, some people will only do like the resources that exactly pertain to the specific aims. If you look at my resource pages, I'm talking about how many books are in the library. I'm talking about the CCTS. I'm talking about anything that might potentially, you know, if I got a collaborator from family medicine or exercise medicine, I'm putting that stuff in there. So I like to go big. Um, I don't know what you think, Mary. Well, I, I would agree because remember, this is about career development. And I think... It helps in two ways. One, it lets the reviewers know that you have a lot of resources, and two, it informs you as to what resources might be there that you can take advantage of. Yep. So I think it's worth doing. And there is a lot of stock text for those of you wondering about that. There is a lot of boilerplate text that exists already yep. for that. Purpose. And and you might not find uh, with the examples, at least the ones I looked at, I didn't find examples of resources. Um, but you know, the, I think the first time I tried to supersize my resources, I can't remember when this started. I was just googling the hell out of every like you know website, <laughs> and uh, it's not that's a way you know that takes a lot of time. But um, you know, ask people for their resource page. You know, talk to people. Um, you know, just keep asking people for different things because it'll, uh, you know, everybody's got a resource page. Anybody who's put a grant in has a resource page. And you think about the um, opportunities that the CCTS has developed there. I mean, you've, with talking about the, the panels construct, the specific aims um, workshops, the, the bird, um, all of those things are resources that you should be able to talk about in a K. Yep. And it's really nice to, I mean, it's not super often that you, you know, critique a um, environment, but I mean, why, you know, you don't need to give them any opportunity to do that. <laughs> don't, do not open that door. <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing that's important is you do, you know, again, read read the announcement, make sure you follow it, read it and read it and read it and read it again. I make my own little internal checklist where I've got the dead, NIH mm -hmm. deadline, then I double check with my award person of when the dead, internal deadline is, and then I might backtrack to like, when do I want it to have it to internal reviewers to look at it? And then I have like two columns, I might have like the path, you know, I'll have abstract or narrative draft and not draft and then I just look at that it's like in my face when I come in every day so that I know I'm on track or not on track um, tr you know don't forget the training in, in, in uh, conduct of research or conduct of you know yeah research it needs to go I feel like right after that uh, career development so it's a an important section that's completely easy to read write 
And um, there might be some variation in what people do, but I'm sure you can find examples through the CTS and then you can wander the halls asking people for their sections. Um, yeah. And there are actually fairly specific expectations that NIH has about RCR training. Yeah. And if you don't find, like, they want duration and frequency, blah, 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 right. um, if it's hard to find. So this is a section that should not take that long for you to write. It's not rocket science. And it's even easier if you find um, examples of people who, you know, right. had successful grants and they had that section. Right? Questions about the mentorship method. So, it's a component, including the mentor experience to mentees, is a component for every, like, if I have two co mentors, and like, because really it's my primary mentor, doesn't have another pay or worthy and successful start yeah. of the pay for our transition. So, we actually have to actually bring someone specific doing the mentoring part. Is that a component that has to include it? Because the, I mean, my primary mentor um, doesn't have this experience. Does he still have to buy that? I have three or four panels that work in my lab. So you're going to have page limitations. So you'll need to really look at your specific institute and what type of K it is and, and make sure you've got it down. If you, um, from what I remember, um, I haven't reviewed these in a, a year or year and a, I don't know, for about a year or so. Um, you know, generally having one person as the primary and then a you know, co-mentors just a little bit step down. Um, you'd want to have strong letters for both of them, but if the total is like four pages, and again, you'll have to double check, then maybe you're given two, two and a half pages to the person who's designated as the lead primary mentor, and then the co-mentor, you know, says great things about themselves and you. Um, and then you're having, a, you know, a lot less for the other folks. So, um, you know, you should certainly, get every, the mentorship team is gonna be unique to you. So everybody in this room is fighting K pretty much, and you're all gonna have different, you know, it's gonna be unique to you and your training gaps and your the mentees funding. So you're the number of ones you have, some of you will have a couple mentors and some advisors, some of you will have you know, several mentors, you don't want to have 30 because, you know, we know that you're not going to be able to get all those people in one room to do a team mentoring thing, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't have a right number, but, you know, you know it when it's too much and you know it when it's too little. What is the ideal size of a mentorship team? Yeah, that's what I just said. You, yeah. you know, there's no ideal size because it depends on if you have, you know, five gaps in training, and each you need a kind of a mentor or advisor for each of those gaps or maybe one mentor can do both then you've got more than the guy next door who yeah. you know so it really is unique to you but you you, you don't want to have you know one and you've clearly got five gaps or three training gaps or whatever and you don't want to have 30. and try not to make it overlap with the gaps too because yeah that's another key and then one mentor is yeah. It's a delicate balance, and I think it's it, it, it provides an opportunity to have some, um, you know, really honest questions with people um, who are potentially your mentors. And I actually think, you know, you know, let's say you got some mid-career people that mentoring people for mid-career people mentoring others is really a critical part of their career directory, just like it will be for you guys in a little while. And so if you totally ignore all those mid-career people and only go for the, you know, Nobel Prize winners, um, first of all, you're probably missing an opportunity to get some real on the ground mentorship. Um, but also, you know, you're going to, it's, you know, you're going to be thinking, gosh, you know, that might happen to me in a couple of years. So um, it, it's a team that you're putting together. Some people are on the field at certain times. Some people aren't, but they're all invested in you. And you might even want to go to somebody outside of your mentoring team, somebody who's going to be really honest and open. You can certainly get this in specific games workshops and through the CCS. And we, we're, we're all, I mean, lots of us are opinionated. We'll tell you 
um, you know, what we think, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's why we're here, because, you know, I never liked criticism. I was pretty, uh, I used to be more, used to be shy. Yeah. Um, and I, I hated the criticism because I wasn't that secure about, like, I knew I really, really wanted to do research. I knew I was persistent, but I didn't, you know, I just wasn't, didn't, wasn't the right institution um, for me. They didn't have a lot of K's, but uh, so, but I really feel like the biggest thing I'm going to pat myself on the back is that I'm much better at trying to get um, feedback from people. Um, and this is really critical. It's a great, it's a great vehicle to really have a good time, meet some amazing mentors and, and learn a lot about yourself. Exactly. Great. Anything else? Last question, anything?